If we could all take our seats. Uh, well, welcome to Brookings. Welcome to everybody here. Welcome to people in the overflow room, to people watching on the webcast, and to people following us on Twitter and other social media that I've been reminded about and I'm still trying to learn. Uh, I'm Bill Antholis. I'm the managing director at Brookings, which, as I like to say, means I do whatever Bruce Katz and the team at Metro tells me to do. And, uh, and today's topic is one that is uh, not only a big part of the Metropolitan Policy Program, it's a big part of all of Brookings. It's very dear to my heart and Strobe Talbot, the president, John Thornton, the chairman of Brookings, and our board of trustees. And that's uh, jobs and the clean economy. Um, which connects to a, what we call an all Brookings priority here of energy and climate policy. We have five research programs at Brookings. Uh, Metro is uh, the youngest, but, um, or maybe the second youngest, um, uh, but is a real leader in this area. But all five of our research programs have people who have worked on energy and climate issues still working on them from China Energy and the Foreign Policy Program, Energy Security Initiative, also in foreign policy, scholars and economic studies who model climate change, who model energy policy, and people in governance studies such as myself who work on uh, various dimensions of everything from the, the, uh, uh, the new grid to uh, the domestic governance and international governance of energy issues. It's a real priority here at Brookings. But as I said, our Metropolitan Program has been a real leader on this in so many ways, um, as we will see in today's discussion of, of their report on sizing uh, the green economy and jobs. Let me just touch on a few other points. Personally, this is a huge topic for me. Uh, I've been working on it for 15 years since the Denver G7 summit, um, or summit of the eight as it became uh, known, uh, when Governor Ritter, I think, was the district attorney of Denver. So he was probably looking for all the, uh, the people that were trying to bash barricades and the rest as they shut down the city of Denver for these heads of state to arrive. And at that summit, the U.S. was touting a very strong, robust economy, and leaders from the rest of the world, uh, as President Clinton liked to say afterwards to those of us working on his staff, uh, he, he was made to be the skunk at his own garden party because we didn't have uh, climate change policy and the Europeans were pushing us very hard to do so. That was about six months before Kyoto, and the government went into a crash course to prepare for uh, the Kyoto climate change talks, and that was my, my own baptism on this issue. And for the last 14 years, this subject, what kind of green jobs will this create, has been either a sub-theme or a front and center theme. Uh, a year ago, when the US Senate was trying to match the House of Representatives in coming up with a comprehensive energy and climate policy, uh, at that point, the recession was still uh, in its depths. And President Obama was out trying to talk about the creation of green jobs. But the question of how many green jobs would be created kept coming up. And frankly, there was no compelling answer. And there's real reasons why there's no compelling answer, which is these are very hard issues. There's a lot of uncertainty about the economics, about what counts as green, the environmental dimensions to this. Um, even some of the great game changers, like natural gas, have a huge set of questions around them. Uh, on the green side and on the economy side. Um, and so what, what we have today is really a terrific first draft. Well, it's actually it's a, a real report, but it's a first attempt, I think, in very concrete terms, starting at the local level where people really worry about jobs and job creation, to size that up. Um, it's, it is terrific work. It's done with a lot of partners uh, who you will be seeing today. Uh, and it will break down into uh, three different parts. Uh, first, a discussion at the firm level of what job creation looks like, then at the regional and metro level, and then at a broader policy macro level where Bruce will be having a conversation with, uh, with Governor Ritter, who's now at Colorado State University. So with that, I really thank you all for coming. It's, uh, this is really a terrific report and a great set of discussions that we're looking forward to. And I'll turn it over to uh, Bruce Katz. So morning, everyone. Um, I want to thank Bill uh, for the introduction and the context setting and really for uh, his leadership in this institution and on this issue over, over many years. And before proceeding, I just want to start by thanking the people who actually did the work. I've got the easy job today. Uh, Mark Muro, Jonathan Rothwell, Devashri Saha, 
others on our staff, and then our colleagues at Battelle, uh, Mitch Horowitz, Marty Gruber, creativity, collegiality, painstaking attention to detail over a very, very long period of time. At the end of all these reports at Brookings, everyone asks, Sh should we have really done that? You know, because it takes so much time and so much work. But so thank you to everyone who really did the hard research on this. And also um, Nathan Cummings Foundation, General Electric Foundation, Lazard, Living Cities, CERDNA for their particular support on our clean economy work, and then the Rockefeller Foundation who is supporting our policy and practice work around the clean economy in states and metropolitan areas. So a lot of thank yous at, at the beginning. Um, it, I, I was going to try to find something along the lines of it takes a village. It takes think tanks, tech companies, a whole bunch of folks to get this stuff done. Today, um, as Bill is saying, we're celebrating not just the release of a report sizing the clean economy, but the unveiling of an interactive website to spur further research, policy, and practice all freely available at brookings.edu slash clean economy. Uh, we want today's forum to be a participatory event. We urge all of you in the audience and following on our webcast to engage online early and often. Please comment on Twitter via the hashtag we've created Clean Econ. Uh, feel free to engage directly with me at Bruce underscore Katz, Mark at Mark Miro one and send us any questions that you have at MetroQ at brookings.edu. So here's the question before us. At a time of economic uncertainty, sluggish recovery, uh, federal polarization, can America's cities and metropolitan areas lead the country to a clean economy, to create jobs in the near term and retool and restructure our economy for the long haul. There is no doubt in our minds that moving to a clean economy is an environmental and energy imperative. But consumers, companies, and cities are also sending a clear signal. This is a market proposition and an economic transformation as profound as the information revolution. Consumers around the globe are starting to demand lower carbon, energy efficient products and services. One in four drivers in the United States, Europe, China, and Japan say that they plan to buy electric vehicles when they are readily available. That would put about 50 million electric cars on the road in places from Baltimore to Beijing to Reno to Tokyo. Companies see the clean economy as a growth sector. Three quarters of major global corporations plan to increase their clean tech budgets from 2012 to 2014, and global private investment in clean energy alone is up more than six-fold since 2004, reaching $154 billion in 2010. And cities and their metropolitan areas, who have been early adapters of sustainable practice, are now competing to build out their special niches in the clean economy. And I'll provide details later on Greater Seattle's bold strategies, just one among many to be the global hub of clean IT. Now for two years, the Brookings Metro program has hammered home the notion that the United States must pursue a different growth model post-recession. That is a next economy driven by exports, powered by low carbon, fueled by innovation, rich with opportunity, and delivered by the large metropolitan areas that drive our economy. Now today we're gonna to literally flip the dial and place the clean economy in the center of that macro vision and unveil the scale, the scope, the spatial geography of this promising growth engine. We have three sharp and timely findings. First, the clean economy is a significant, diverse, emerging market in the United States, already populated by seven, some 2.7 million jobs. It is disproportionately manufacturing and export intensive and offers better prospects for low and middle skilled workers than the national economy as a whole. This is exactly the kind of economy we want to build post-recession. Second, metro areas are on the vanguard of the clean economy due to their concentration of innovative drivers and institutions, as well as the built environment in which most people live, work, and play. As in exports, 
metros specialize in different sectors of the clean economy, and the clustering of firms is catalyzing productive and sustainable growth. Third, the U.S. must unleash the entrepreneurial energies and dynamism of our metro engines to accelerate growth of the clean economy. That will require a strategic mix of private sector leadership and innovation and public policy that is stable, supportive, certain, and predictable. Given the nature and scale of global competition, U.S. governments at all levels must get in the game rather than get out of the way. Smart public action can leverage private investment, create desperately needed jobs, and cement our position as the leading edge of innovative growth. So the stakes are very high, and I don't think we should have any illusions about this. We have a lot to do here, and we are falling behind globally. Our competitors in mature and rising economies, Germany, Japan, China, fully understand the potential of clean, and they are working at warp speed to set favorable conditions for rapid growth and grab their share of the next market revolution. We need to get our public-private act together in cities and metros, in state capitals, and at the now polarized federal level. So let's start with our first finding. The clean economy is a significant, diverse, emerging market in the United States. In total, we find there are some 2.7 million clean economy jobs all across the United States. To put that number in perspective, the clean economy is nearly twice the size of the biosciences field and 60% of the 4.8 million strong IT sector. And as you can tell, the clean economy also has more jobs than fossil fuel related industries. Now our definition of the clean economy is as follows. Any economic activity measured in terms of establishments and jobs that produces goods and services with an environmental benefit or adds value to such project products using skills or technologies that are uniquely applied to those products. Now this definition yields a broad and varied picture of economic activity, old and new, public and private, green and blue. At the highest level, we find establishments and jobs grouping together in five discernible categories. Renewable energy, energy and resource efficiency, greenhouse gas reduction, environmental management and recycling, agricultural and natural resources conservation, and education and compliance. Now here we follow the categorization the Bureau of Labor Statistics is using for its own green jobs assessment due next year. Now these categories then break down into fine grain segments, ultimately 39 in all. Renewable energy, for example, has nine segments, including solar and geothermal power and renewable energy services. Energy and resource efficiency has 13 separate segments, from electric vehicle technology to water efficient products. Greenhouse gas reduction, environmental management, and recycling has 12 segments, including green chemical products and professional environmental services, and so on. You, you get the idea. Each of the segments, in turn, then has a very distinct economic profile, cutting across multiple activities, skills and occupations, and a distinct special geography given the special assets and attributes of different places. So let's drill down a little so we just get on the same page. Under renewable energy, let's look at solar photovoltaics, a young, rapidly innovating area. This segment we find employs, employs more than 24,000 people in 555 establishments. The list includes two major solar manufacturing firms, First Solar with a major plant in Toledo, BP Solar with a facility in this region, in Frederick, and Bombard Electric in Las Vegas, which helps businesses in that region. The casinos, the hotels, the shopping centers shift their energy use. Under greenhouse gas reduction, let's take a look at professional environmental services, an example of the role that expert services can play in both domestic and global markets. This segment is much, much bigger, 140,000 workers 
in 5,400 establishments. CH2M in Denver is a consulting services providing uh, its wares throughout the United States and the world. Ecology Environment is a science and technical services firm with a large presence in LA. And then there's Black & Veatch out of Kansas City, which is an engineering firm specializing in areas from environmental permitting to remediation. One more definitional cut to consider. We've identified a group of young, super innovative clean tech industries that cross multiple categories and show enormous growth potential. These industries are populated by companies with a median age of 15 years or less. And most notably, this portfolio of segments, including wind power, battery technologies, biofuels, and smart grid, grew about 8% a year since 2003, or twice as fast as the rest of the economy. So the clean economy is, not, is broad and it's diverse, uh, and providing that baseline definition we think is so critical to public discourse and private sector action going forward. It is also disproportionately productive. The clean economy is export intensive, already taking advantage of the demand for clean goods and services coming from abroad. In 2009, clean economy establishments exported about $54 billion, including about $49.5 billion in goods and an additional $4.5 billion in services. Significantly, clean economy establishments are, by our calculations, twice as export intensive as the national economy. Over $20,000 worth of exports is sold for every job in the clean economy each year, compared to just $10,400 worth of exports for the average U.S. job. Now, the export orientation of the clean economy today provides a platform for more exports tomorrow. With rising nations rapidly urbanizing, the demand for sustainable growth in all its dimensions will only grow, and the U.S. has the potential to serve that demand. The clean economy also supports a production-driven innovation economy. We find it employs a higher percentage of scientists than the national economy. 10% of clean economy jobs are in science and engineering, compared to 5% in the U.S. economy generally. Now, as we know, manufacturing and innovation are inextricably linked. This provides a stark challenge to the United States. We will innovate less unless we produce more. By our account, the clean economy is a vehicle for production. 26% of all clean economy jobs are involved in manufacturing, compared to just 9% of jobs in the economy as a whole. Manufacturing accounts for a majority of the jobs in over half of the clean economy segments, with many sectors having a supermajority of production-oriented jobs. Solar and wind energy, for example, have more than two-thirds of their jobs in manufacturing. And some segments, including appliances, water-efficient products, and electric vehicle technologies have over 90% of their jobs in manufacturing. The good news, clean manufacturing is growing, even in the face of national declines over the past decade in manufacturing employment. Finally, the clean economy is opportunity rich, providing prospects for a wide range of workers and good wages up and down the skills ladder. The clean economy is easy to enter, available to people of all skill levels. 45% of all clean jobs are held by workers with a high school diploma or less, compared to only 37% of U.S. jobs. Now, once a worker enters the field, he or she is more likely to receive career-building training. 41% of clean jobs offer medium to long-term training, compared to just 23% of U.S. jobs. The payoff is higher wages. The median wage in the clean economy is about $44,000 for the average occupation. That's significantly higher than the national equivalent of $38,000 in change. In summary, the clean economy is the kind of economy we want to build post-recession. Export-oriented, innovation-fueled, opportunity-rich, and balanced. So here's our second finding. Metros are on the vanguard 
of the clean revolution. Here's the heart of the American economy, 100 metropolitan areas that after decades of growth take up only 12% of our land mass, but harbor two thirds of our population and generate 75% of our gross domestic product. So this is a new economic geography, enveloping cities and suburbs, exurbs, and rural towns. And our research shows the extent to which these top 100 metropolitan areas in the aggregate are driving growth in the clean economy. In 2010, they constitute an increasing share of clean economy jobs, almost 64% in total. And they include an outsized share, 74% of jobs, in clean tech industries, including extraordinarily high shares in solar PV, battery technologies, smart grid, and wind energy. Innovative clean jobs are predominantly in the top 100 metros because these places concentrate the assets that drive innovation. From research institutions, to intermediaries, to commercialization, to ultimate deployment. Now the major metros are also leading the growth of clean economy jobs around the built environment. They harbor 78% of jobs in public mass transit, 90% of the jobs in green architecture, design and construction, since moving people more efficiently and making buildings energy efficient will primarily be a metropolitan act, given that's where most people live and travel and businesses locate. Incredibly, metros also include a decent share of clean jobs that are traditionally rural, with at least 23% of jobs in resource intensive activities like hydropower, sustainable forestry products and biofuels, and more than half of organic food and farming jobs. Now, metro economies, of course, do not exist in the aggregate. They have distinctive starting points and distinctive assets, attributes, and advantages. So our research digs deep to profile the clean economy potential of each of the top 100 metropolitan areas. Now, four metros, New York, LA, Chicago, and Washington are supersized job centers with more than 70,000 jobs apiece in the clean economy in 2010. The New York Metro alone has more than 152,000 clean economy jobs by our calculation. Other major metros, Philadelphia, San Francisco, Atlanta, Boston, Houston, Dallas, are also key players with more than 38,000 jobs apiece as of that year. Yet it's not just about the large metros. As we see here, a very different group of small and medium-sized metros have more than 3.3% of their jobs situated in the clean economy. And Albany leads the way with an impressive 6.3% of its jobs in the clean economy. The power of metros is the power of agglomeration, networks, and clusters. Our report finds that clusters the proximity of firms to businesses and related industries boost metros growth performance in the clean economy and metros facilitate clustering. Examples include professional environmental services in Houston, solar photovoltaic in LA, fuel cells in Boston, wind in Chicago, water industries in Milwaukee, and energy efficiency in Philadelphia. So we can talk about clusters in the abstract, but it's best to see them in practice from the ground up. So let's travel to Philadelphia, the nation's fifth largest metropolis, which includes the city, obviously, and the surrounding counties. It's the fifth largest clean economy job center in the country. So here we find the advanced research engines of the University of Pennsylvania and Drexel in University City, who have partnered together on clean energy research and have provided a steady stream of talented workers to public and private nonprofit firms and intermediaries. Now, these universities are part of the Greater Philadelphia Innovation Cluster, based at the Navy Yard on the Delaware River. This consortium received $129 million in federal funding from multiple agencies to demonstrate the e efficacy of new building energy efficient components, systems, and models. The consortium includes strong support of City Hall, led by Mayor Michael Nutter, who
who has pioneered smart skills training in the energy efficient sector, as well as the Philadelphia Industrial Development Corporation, which has been a major investor in the Navy Yard. And then, of course, there are the firms and the companies, the fuel of the economy located throughout the Philadelphia metropolis. Downtown, we find Veridity Energy, a small smart grid firm with powerful technology tools. The density of Center City obviously supports a healthy mix of highly skilled service firms. So just around the corner is Real Win Win, which provides finance services to companies making capital investments in energy efficiency. But metro economies cross city and county borders because different kinds of firms require different urban and suburban footprints. So when we look out to the suburb of Radnor, just past Bryn Mawr and I-476, we find Iberdrola, the second largest wind operator in the United States, a subsidiary, a subsidiary of a major Spanish renewable energy company, and an example of the wave of foreign direct investment from Germany, from Spain, frankly, ultimately from China, that can help the US build out the clean economy. The Philly story reveals why cities and metro areas power our economy. Hyperlinked networks of private firms and public and nonprofit institutions that fertilize ideas, share workers, extend innovation, enhance competitiveness, and catalyze growth. So that leads to the final proposition. To build out this next economy, the US must unleash the entrepreneurial energies and dynamism of our metropolitan engines. We compete in a fiercely competitive world. While America continues to debate the legitimacy of global warming research, our competitors in established nations like Germany, Japan, and the UK, and rising nations like China are taking transformative steps to grow their clean economies in the precise places, Munich and Tokyo, London and Shanghai, that drive their national economies. The United States could compete with these and other nations. No other nation can match us in domestic demand, advance research, venture capital, the power of metro concentration. But our potential will not be realized unless we provide a strong policy platform for the build out of the clean economy. Four steps are essential, are outlined in the report. Step one, scale up markets by catalyzing demand for clean economy goods and services. Markets respond to prices, standards, certainty, as well as the procurement and purchasing decisions of government. Step two, drive innovation by investing in advanced R&D at scale over a sustained period of time via new distributed networks. The US has a distinct competitive advantage in the innovation space if we fund it and if we exploit it. Step three, catalyze finance to produce and deploy more of what we invent. We cannot just be a nation of idea generators. We need to produce and manufacture and deploy again. And step four, align with cities and metropolitan areas to realize the synergies of clustering and place. Now our competitors know that economy shaping of this magnitude should start at the national scale. And so in a perfect world, we would have a federal government that would create a framework for growth and success. Now we have seen some of that leadership in the past few years through the procurement driving market scaling efforts of the Department of Defense, the creation of new very successful innovation vehicles like ARPA-E, some of the financial investments of the Department of Energy's loan guarantee program, and the metro supporting investments in new energy regional innovation clusters, like the Greater Philadelphia example, supported by agencies with diverse sets of missions and resources, like the Department of Energy, Commerce, Labor, SBA, Education, and others. But our global competitors are up in their goals, they're expanding their commitments, so we desperately need our federal government to go further and act with vision and ambition and consistency and send signals to markets and investors. To scale up markets, Congress should enact a national clean 
energy standard that signals a long-term consistent commitment to alternative energy sources at the national scale. To drive innovation, Congress should embrace the call by the American Energy Innovation Council, led by corporate titans like Bill Gates and Jeff Immelt, to invest $16 billion annually. That's about $11 billion over what we now invest in clean energy research and development through ARPA-E, but also networks of institutions that are multidisciplinary and engage seamlessly with the private sector. To catalyze finance, Congress should authorize a technology deployment finance entity, a green bank for short, to provide finance of the right scale and risk tolerance to ensure that ideas generated in America lead to products made in America. And Congress should also rationalize, reform, and selectively extend the myriad tax provisions and incentives that currently support the clean economy, but which are now chaotic, unstable, inconsistent, and frankly obtuse about evoking innovation and steady price declines from maturing clean technologies. And finally, to align with regions, Congress should more than double the number of energy innovation hubs and clusters that are seated and funded. You know, frankly, it's not difficult to lay out what reforms and investments are needed to grow the clean economy. Our competitors have given us ample guidance on that score. The only issue is whether our federal government, riven by excessive partisanship and ideological polarization, can muster the will to get anything done. Now, fortunately, in the United States, we have a default proposition when our national government falters and goes on a frolic and a detour. Our states act as laboratories of democracy. And as California's Lieutenant Governor Gavin Newsom recently observed, our cities and metropolitan areas act as laboratories of innovation. And so that's how, for the time being, we'll need to build our clean economy in the United States the hard way from the ground up. The good news, there is no shortage of policy innovation and political commitment at the state and metro scale, as we're going to hear, frankly, from Governor Ritter later this morning. To scale up markets, California has set an aggressive renewable portfolio standard, 33% renewable energy by 2020. With that strong foundation, San Jose and other cities and counties in California are doing their part to facilitate and accelerate consumer adoption, streamlining or even eliminating building permits for solar panels. To drive innovation, Wisconsin has created the School of Freshwater Sciences at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee to leverage that metro's rising position in the clean economy, and particularly the blue economy. The Milwaukee Water Council is building on this spearheading a network of scientists and companies to realize Milwaukee's ambition to be the global hub for freshwater research, firm creation, and business expansion. To catalyze finance, Connecticut recently created the Connecticut Clean Energy Finance and Investment Authority, capitalized with some $50 million annually. This green bank could accelerate the generation, the transmission, the adoption of alternative energy. At the municipal scale, New York City has, has capitalized an energy efficiency corporation to spur the financing, working closely with the private sector on new products, the financing of energy efficiency in the building sector. And finally, smart metros are now moving to build out their special industry clusters. In greater Seattle, for example, the Puget Sound Regional Council, government and business has developed a business plan to cement that metro's natural position as the global hub of energy efficient building technologies. Their smart public-private initiative is to establish a facility to test, integrate, and verify promising energy efficient products and services before launching them to market. And significantly, that metro vision is being supported by the state of Washington, which is committed to match any federal investment in the testing network, and ultimately that testing facility will be self-sustaining from the private sector. So let me conclude with this vision. Let's imagine a world in 20 years where the clean economy permeates every aspect of our economic and social fabric, 
and in the process enhances productivity and competitiveness, lowers energy use, energy dependence, spurs further innovation, and provides quality work, quality jobs for a broad cross-section of our citizenry. We believe today's research and the power of millions of consumers and entrepreneurs, tens of thousands of companies, and hundreds of cities and metros gives us the hope that this vision can become reality. We have the data to set a platform for sustainable growth. We have the roadmap to set the foundation for smart investment. We have the entrepreneurs in all sectors, public, private, civic, to innovate and then replicate those innovations. Let's build the clean economy, worker by worker, firm by firm, metropolitan area by metropolitan area. Thank you very much. A um, couple questions, and then we'll move on to question back here. Yeah, we are uh, a small manufacturing company. My partner, Roger Cope, and I, we've invested about $25 million in the last three years in technology upgrades, in innovation, in, in ways to manufacture uh, products, and a lot of it is in the wind, in, in, in the wind innovation industry. One of the problems is how does a small voice get heard? We now have an opportunity to start at the foundation of manufacturing from a, a casting or a foundry type situation that is a clean foundry uh, that is different than anything in the world and we need to find some money. And it's very difficult after we've, we're a small company ourselves, about $40 million, we employ about 200 people and we've kind of exhausted what we can do on our own and now we need a place that says we need to be able to go to the marketplace and get funding to build this. It's available now. It's going to happen now. These are things that will employ people right now. A entrepreneur, as you say, going into the marketplace, is he bankable? Are these right. ideas bankable? Uh, most of your entrepreneurial ideas are, are muddy and gooey, and they're not bankable. So how do we find a place that takes this muddy and gooey and sticky kind of stuff and says it's real? This is something that creates exactly where you want to go, not 20 years from now, today. I right. will, I'll invest this afternoon, if I can find the person that will do it with me, in this process, in the ways to do things, but there's no avenue for a small voice like mine to get anywhere. How do you suggest we do that? Where, where are you located? Just by, by where? Michigan. Michigan. So I, I think over time, frankly, um, the kind of investments you're seeking will be more routine in the United States. But we're coming out of an economic model where it was very easy to finance real estate, very easy to finance housing growth, and fairly complicated to finance in the manufacturing and industrial sector. We had a certain growth model in this country, and we're now transitioning slowly to a growth model that's more productive and sustainable um, and ultimately inclusive. Um, at the end of the day, for this transition period, because it's nice to talk about 20 years, but um, you've got a proposition today. <laughs> um, you know, I think what we're going to be seeing really is at the local and metropolitan and, and state scale, the kind of public-private investments that sort of bridge this period, where ultimately we can move to more sustainable finance, primarily driven at the private sector. Um, you know, Michigan, uh, from my perspective, is the Germany of the United States. It is production oriented, it is export oriented. You could actually see Canada from Detroit, you know. <laughs> um, what, what, what we need to find within the resources of that state, and I'm not just talking on the tax side or the revenue side, but in the incredible wealth that has been built up in that state from the manufacturing sector are the right vehicles that can support these kind of propositions. But that to me is a bridge. I mean, ultimately, if government sets a platform, sends signals to the market about certainty and predictability and stability that we are moving down this path, the private sector, I think, will finance most of this. And that, may, that time won't be too far away. Um, other questions, comments? Rachel? Well, you, you can't ask a question. No, it's not for me. We have <laughs> oh. a question from Twitter. OK. <laughs> um, and it's from the Millville Partners Group. And they're wondering. How can we overcome the hyper-partisan politics of this? And as I was saying, we're about to move to our second panel. Um, I, you know, I think the further on down you go in our system, 
the less partisan it is. And, and I, think because, I think there is a natural, what we would call a pragmatic caucus in the United States. And that particularly exists at the local and metropolitan scale, but in many places exists at the state scale. Because the members of that caucus, and I'm not just talking about elected officials, but corporate leaders, university leaders, civic leaders, and elected officials, prize place over party and prize collaboration over conflict. They wake up every day saying, how do I make Denver better? How do I make Colorado better? And they don't exist in this kind of ideological food fight that tends to permeate the federal discourse. So I think the way we build out the clean economy, and frankly, we restore sanity to our political system, is from the ground up, and from this pragmatic network of people who understand that the challenge today is to create jobs in the near term, retool the economy for the long haul, and deal with these pressing global energy and environmental imperatives. So I'm, you know, we're sitting in a town that today, day by day, is talking about the debt limit and talking about some very, very complicated budget and tax uh, issues, and hopefully they'll be able to resolve that. But over time, I think the real resolution to partisanship and polarization is by taking a lesson from the practitioners and the pragmatists at the local level. And with that, I am going to introduce Brian Walsh. Um, I think people, anyone who reads Time Magazine or follows the blogosphere um, is familiar with Brian. Um, he is one of the principal writers, thinkers, observers in the environmental and clean economy scene. Um, and he is an avid tweeter. Um, so Brian will come up and introduce the next panel. Thank you very much.